Well, hey there, folks. It's just me. Uh, kind of an impromptu thing. I decided I would uh, take a little time and, and uh, look at the policies and platform of Jeremy Farkas, who's running for election here in the great city of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, I have probably unfairly referred to him as very fashy in the past. Um, I don't know that that's an entirely fair take, but he's certainly very conservative, and I have concerns uh, anytime I see the support for conservatives, which in Alberta is all the time. Alberta is a very conservative place, and um, that's sort of what we know. Part of this came from, I saw the other day, I was walking down the street, and I saw a... Um, couple of posters up one of them and on the same property one of them said like protect our water and then right beside it was vote for Farkas and I was like I don't think we uh, I don't think we understand what we're talking about so I want to I want to dig in and, and just sort of go over uh, my thoughts at least on Jeremy Farkas before I do I should pop open my Facebook because friggin Facebook doesn't do that thing where you can see comments in my little little chat thing there. Um, if you are watching, feel free to chat, feel free to ask questions, feel free to point out if I'm making anything, you know, stupid statements or anything like that. Um, which, goodness knows, can happen. Um, but I have to have this open so I can see if anyone asks questions on the Facebook. So, without any further to do, let's pop over to my browser view, which is conveniently on Jeremy's uh, homepage. Handsome looking devil. I'll definitely, uh, you know, give him that. Um, you know, not my cup of tea. I, I prefer, I prefer my uh, conservatives to be ugly and unappealing and horrifying. But uh, you know, in his own right, he's he's all those things and more. So this is Jeremy Farkas's website. Uh, we're gonna start off with Meet Jeremy, just so we can get an idea of who he is. So, Jeremy's fresh new brand of leadership will kickstart the economy, restore jobs, and bring positive change to solve our city's urgent challenges. That's a, you know, bold claim. Let's find out more. He's a born and raised Calgarian from the southeast community of Dover, which is a very working class community. Um, Jeremy's family story is one of hard work and sacrifice. Jeremy's father arrived in Canada in 1957 as a refugee from communist Hungary. And his mother traces her roots to settlers who immigrated from Eastern Europe to homestead and build a better life. That is actually an important thing for understanding uh, Jeremy. There's a thing called the Hungarian 56ers. Um, in 1956, uh, and I had this pointed out to me when I last talked about civic politics uh, by my friend Nicole. Um, in 1956, a great deal of Hungarian people... Um, came to very, you know, North America, all over Europe. Um, communism was a thing in Hungary at the time, and essentially they paid for uh, smugglers to get them out of the country, um, braved, uh, basically, you know, braved death trying to escape communist Hungary. Um, as it is well known, I am a libertarian socialist, which means that um, I value liberty very much, and as a result, I absolutely understand the desire to flee communist Hungary. It was a pretty awful place with a pretty awful regime. Um, but a lot of the people who are 56ers from Hungary, uh, from Hungary, from Hungary, uh, from Hungary, uh, a lot of the 56ers um, adopted very conservative, like, sort of like anything but communist kind of perspective. So someone like me, who is a libertarian socialist, um, would be considered an, an, a, you know, a, a downright enemy because they hear socialist and they think evil communism that my family escaped. Uh, so Jeremy learned from a young age that anything is possible if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and work for it. His early years included delivering flyers at the age of eight years old, which I don't think kids can do anymore. Um, I delivered flyers at eight years old. Oh, good crack. Uh, bussing tables, laboring in an Ogden shingle factory, and working his way through school. Nothing wrong with that. 
After earning a political science degree from the UFC, Jeremy launched his entrepreneurial spirit through the startup of a successful small business in data analysis and technology. As jobs evaporated, which is a strange, strange way to put it, um, we actually have had a very solid economy. Uh, you know, we, we go through waves. This is Alberta. And because we are so heavily tied to oil and gas, I guarantee you the data analysis and technology job was was. I would, I would almost guarantee it was in the oil and gas uh, world. And when that, one, that world goes, hi, Abby, that world goes through ebbs and flows of uh, activity based on the uh, oil and gas price. So it can be a very difficult thing to, to make a go of when you're reliant on an industry that is ostensibly unreliable. Um, so I wouldn't say that jobs are evaporating. We still have plenty of jobs in oil and gas. We just... They come and they go. Uh, he saw the burden on taxpayers grow heavier and how everyday Calgarians were ignored by an out-of-touch city hall establishment. Jeremy grew frustrated seeing his peers move away to seek opportunity elsewhere. Rather than stand by and watch, Jeremy committed to do something about it. On the surface, that's fine. It's a question really of, you know, what did he commit to do about it and why did he perceive the city as being out of touch? Um... I would argue that the the city has for quite a long time been fairly in touch and has been smart about managing the realities of, of this dependence on the oil and gas sector. And when the industry has been uh, failing, I think they've done a good job of, of um, bolstering our economy a little bit. From day one, Jeremy kept true to his word and has been working on behalf of Calgary families, seniors, young people, and businesses. Cool. Jeremy's record demonstrates his commitment to improving Calgarians' everyday lives by championing wiser spending, lower taxes, better core services, and a safer community. This is ultimately where my concern lies. Wiser spending generally is a conservative talking point for cuts to services. Uh, you know, we, we love to talk about how we're just rooting out the waste, but the problem is We've been rooting out the waste for 30, 40 years. There, there ain't no fucking waste anymore. Or if there is, it's very minimal. Um, when we talk about lowering taxes, really the only lower taxes from a, from a municipal perspective uh, relate to property tax. Um, and property taxes are high um, but I'll get into that when we talk to talk about things. But if we're wiser spending basically means stopping waste, quote unquote, lowering taxes means reducing our, our amount of income as a city, better core services. Well, that's how do you have better services by not paying as much money for them? That doesn't make any sense. And a safer community. Um, our communities are not actually that unsafe. This is a fairly safe city. It is not perfect, but th this sounds to me like a bit of a, uh, not dog whistle per se, but, you know, implying that we need more popo lease. Jeremy will bring a fresh new kind of leadership that will rally Calgarians together behind bold ideas that will turn things around and bring positive change to our city. Again, a bold statement, fresh new kind of leadership. When you're talking about wiser spending, lower taxes, better services, and safer community, what you're actually talking about is everything conservatives have said in this province for 100 years. So I challenge the idea that that's a fresh new kind of leadership, but okay. Jeremy understands firsthand that Calgarians are trailblazers at heart and that our city was built on the backs of hardworking, innovative, and entrepreneurial people. Uh, that's an empty statement. That's just one of those, you know, we're the best darn team going, gang. As mayor, he will bring fresh ideas and new energy to Calgarians together to solve our city's urgent challenges and kickstart our economic engine. An avid outdoor enthusiast, cyclist, and runner, Jeremy complete, competes regularly in the uh, Calgary Ironman 70.3, and gives back as a career mentor to post-secondary students. Well, that's a very uh, reasonable thing. Uh, it's up to you. Are you with him? Probably not. Uh, I'm not going to watch his video. We might watch some of the videos in a bit. But let's go to the priorities. Because that's the meat of what I want to talk about. 
Calgarians deserve smarter spending, lower taxes, better core services, and safer communities. Your and he calls himself Jeremy. That that's a branding choice that always irks the piss out of me. Like you know, Jeremy is it's it's like when you go to a chiropractor and his name is Doctor Kevin. Like fuck off, Doctor Kevin. You're Doctor Johnson or you're Kevin, but. Dr. Kevin just, it sounds like I'm professional, but really approachable. Um, I don't feel like, like I used to work at a company called uh, in Canna when they were formed. Um, and the president of Encana was Gwyn Morgan, who insisted that we call him Gwyn in a me- uh, desire to seem like an approachable chap. He was not. He was not. Um... They're, you know, this is a, a common thing business tycoon type dudes do where they'll affably refer to themselves in a folksy sort of way. Like, like Dave Thomas from Wendy's, you know, that, that like, hey, I'm just a, I'm just a regular guy with a job to do. Hey, uh, but they're not like that in real life. Anyways, I'm just splitting hairs here. Your input is important. It's being used to shape Jeremy's campaign platform, which will be released in the coming months. Here are the four key priorities. Economic growth, always number one. You can tell it's a conservative because economic growth is number one. In fact, that's not a fair statement because most people will probably have economic growth as number one because this is such a conservative city, that's the first thing anyone seems to give a shit about. We need to get Calgarians back to work. We must be unrelenting in our pursuit of economic recovery and growth. Now is the time to reclaim Calgary's entrepreneur-friendly environment and show the world that we are open for business. Positive change begins with reining in taxes, simplifying approvals, eliminating unnecessary red tape, and allowing entrepreneurs to succeed. We need to ensure that our youth and businesses are given no reason to seek opportunity elsewhere. Now, on the surface, those are all great things. Um, So I'm going to go piece by piece. So we need to get Calgarians back to work. Why are Calgarians not working right now? Hmm, could it be COVID? Um, yeah, it's it's COVID. That's that's why. Hang on, my streamy thingy just stopped stream, uh, casting onto my TV. And I don't know what the hell's going on if I can't see how beautiful I look. All right. So, why are Calgarians not working? It's because of COVID. Um, the oil price has gone up to $75 a barrel. Um, that means that there will be new products, new, or not product, new projects. Um, Alberta is one of those places that actually we don't get it, but a high oil price is actually really good for us. Um, that means that there's money in our economy to spend. Um, so... Oil will drive our economy forward, at least until oil collapses or until we get smart and get off of, of reliance on oil and gas. Um, the, the we need to get Calgarians back to work thing is an empty statement because Calgarians are not out of work, out of legitimate economic depression or anything like that. We're out of work because COVID robbed us of work. At the same time, we had all sorts of like, was it, wasn't it the Yuan crashed at the same time? I could be wrong about that timing. I may be way wrong on that. Um, but the uh, price of oil hit, uh, hit like negative $5 a barrel during COVID. We had all kinds of, of real problems, uh, supply chain problems, everything going wrong. Those problems are largely no longer a factor. So our economy will bounce back. And we didn't go too far down the rabbit hole because we had CERB to, you know, act as a, as a pseudo UBI for the, the short term to make sure that people still had money to continue to, to put into the economy through ordering food and, and, you know, buying things online and all that kind of jazz. So it actually hasn't been economically brutal here. There's been layoffs and I'm not downplaying that. There's also been a lot of jobs lost out of, you know, like in the entertainment industry, for example, there's there's not been an entertainment industry. Um, we must be unrelenting in our pursuit of economic recovery and growth. Fine. 
Now's the time to reclaim Calgary's entrepreneur-friendly environment and show the world that we're open for business. Fine. Positive changes begin with reining in taxes, simplifying approvals, and eliminating unnecessary red tape and allowing entrepreneurs to succeed. These are conservative code words. Reining in taxes, again, that just means lowering property tax. Um, conservatives are supposed to be anti-taxi kind of folk, uh, so this isn't a shock. Uh, simplifying approvals is always a concern. We have regulations for a reason. We have red tape, quote unquote, for a reason. And we don't even have that now because our fearless premier, Jason Kenney, uh, passed a law that said that all red tape had to go away. So we don't have red tape anymore. Um, I'm kidding, of course. But approvals take time for a reason. It's because decisions are complicated. And having... Um, reckless stepping forward with with ideas just because economy good is actually a dangerous notion um i hate when people talk about un, uh, eliminating unnecessary red tape you know it's you know it's unnecessary red tape and and simplifying approvals that, that we would want to get rid of workers compensation and and uh not necessarily workers compensation but uh, worker safety programs, uh, employee uh, health and safety, um, environmental protections. You know, we just had this whole thing where we were pushing back on uh, strip mining coal out of uh, the Rocky Mountains because that's a terrible fucking idea. And part of the reason that didn't go through is because of the approvals process and red tape, like making sure that we're not holocausting an ecosystem. So... I hate, I hate shit like this. <laughs> Allowing entrepreneurs to succeed. Okay, if you're an entrepreneur and you can't succeed when you have to do things like get approval for your work, then you're not a very good at entrepreneur. We need to ensure that our youth and small businesses are given no reason to seek opportunity elsewhere. Okay, interesting story there. Um, our youth are having hard times finding work because... Um, COVID. That's kind of the thing. The, the nice thing is, things are not better anywhere else. Financial responsibility. Notice our top two things are economic in nature. City Hall must get its budget under control. Council must follow the lead of families and entrepreneurs who have made sacrifices through these challenging times. This is inherently untrue. Um, as a matter of fact, Keynesian economic economics is pretty clear on, on the topic of how you deal with, uh, ebbs and flows in the market. So when things are bad, you increase your spending. What are you doing? Okay. Enjoy that new peanut butter. Stir it. Um, Keynesian economics says you invest money when, uh, as, as the public sector when times are tight and you take money out when times are good, right? Um, that follows with the approach that we've been taking every time there's a, a serious lapse in the oil price or the oil industry in, on the whole suffers, uh, the city hires. Bingo. The chat is, uh, yeah, hi, hey, I am Canadian. Um, so the city does massive hiring and huge projects in those scenarios because uh, people need to work. And the city knows that if it spends more at that time, it will even out the effect of this um, economic downturn and make it a lot easier for people to weather the storm, both on an individual level and an overall municipal economy level. Any fool can buy high and sell low. Exactly. So when we talk about, you know, all. Oh, I, as a, as a family, I'm smart enough to know that I have to cinch up my belt in these hard times. That's true. But if the government cinches up its belt in those hard times, um, there's no support for people. That's when the government needs to put in some money to allow for the, the municipal side of the public service sector to take some of the burden of the private sector having hard times. 
I don't know how how much easier I can I can put this, but that is a, a dangerous and stupid sentence. Wiser spending and giving Calgarians tax breaks must start now. So tax breaks are a funny story because um, we don't give poor people tax breaks. If you're poor enough, you don't pay taxes. If you're a little bit less poor, then you pay taxes. And it's only once you get into being a really not poor person that all of a sudden tax breaks seem to, to factor into your world. Uh, our social, uh, social uh, so-called conservative politicos talk, buy low and sell high, yet when opportunity shows up wearing uh, coveralls, life looks like shit, and the appropriate time to invest low, a.k.a. make the bet, they cower in lower taxes. Tax breaks benefit those with means. How many tax credits will it take to fit you, if, if lift me out of poverty? Well, honestly, I'd say at least infinity, because there's no, there's no way that tax breaks are ever going to touch me. Um, you know, maybe, maybe at some level when, you know, like I, I will see a few dollars extra in my paycheck because of a tax cut or a tax break, but, um, tax breaks are not for people like me. The theory in conservative politics is you make tax cuts and tax breaks at the very top. And then that trickles down. What do they call that again? Oh yes. Trickle down economics. How's that worked out? Not very well. It never works out very well. Uh, but government waste. Yeah, exactly. Government waste. If the government is so wasteful, then why have we been trimming government waste for like 40 years? Calgarians deserve a financially responsible municipal government, especially during unprecedented times like this COVID-19 pandemic. We must focus on need-to-haves over nice-to-haves. Again, I'm going to 100% disagree with that. The, the biggest thing that helped us weather the COVID-19 unprecedented times um, was CERB. It wasn't throwing uh, giant tax dollars at big corporations that used that money to either buy back stock, move to the states, rebrand, whatever, or, or merge. It was the money that was given to people. Now, that's not a, a, on a municipal level. That's obviously on a federal level. But the concept remains the same. When things are tight, you invest. Chat's going nuts, and it's all just, I am Canadian. Oh, no, kitty kitty jerk face is here, too. How much money has Kenny pissed away out of uh, AIMCO? He's stealing the future of those who managed to save. Fucker. Tell me about it. I go away from work for three years. I come back and take home $300 less a month for, this, uh, for the same salary. Late comment because of sign and verification and ARG. Fuck ass is the same class of fool. Absolutely. Um... Kitty, kitty, jerk face, I, I totally feel your pain. Uh, I'm sure all of the trickling down has trickled down nicely all over you. I'm sure we're, we're all just standing outside, dousing ourselves in the trickle down economics, the pennies just falling from heaven like manna. Sorry, I'm bitter. I admit that I'm bitter, but I've lived in conservative Alberta for so long. Uh, and these are, the, these are the things they say every fucking time. Better core services, which again, we're going to get by not having money. We're, we're just going to have better services. Calgarians deserve good value for their money. Again, we're not wanting to take your money. Every Calgarian deserves a safe and inclusive city. We need a high performance government that will deliver core services efficiently. You know what? Some core services you can't deliver efficiently. Sometimes that efficiency is terrible. Sometimes you need to spend money to make money. Over the past 10 years, property taxes have nearly doubled and many new fees have been introduced. This is true. Our property taxes are fairly unreasonable. Our property valuations are fairly unreasonable. The shitty ghetto clapboard house that I live in is valued at over half a million dollars simply because it has some soil under it and someone goes, ooh, soil good. We're not making more of that. Here's the thing. Here's what's causing our property taxes to rise. And this is something that I'm fairly certain we won't see addressed in here. Our property taxes rise because we keep building new suburbs. Suburbs are always extremely expensive from a municipal perspective. 
you build a new community, you have to put in all the sewer, all the blah, 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 blah. You have to have access to fire services. You have to have police services. You have to have uh, transit. You have to have schools. You have to have all of the things that make a community necessary. So you have to spend the money to build those, and that's municipal dollars. And the amount of property tax you generate from a suburb is usually less because often suburbs have large uh, properties of bungalow type dwellings where people aren't going to be able to spend gi ginormous amounts of money on property tax and would be angry if their property tax was higher as a percentage than say a, a person who lives where I live, which is more in the inner city. Um, that urban sprawl can be solved. The best example of this came from Pittsburgh, where Pittsburgh uh, was, was talking about urban sprawl, and they were like, okay, someone drew a circle on a map and said, Pittsburgh will never be bigger than this. If we want to increase in our number of things, we have to build up. That's the only way to, to avoid urban sprawl, and the only way to, to maintain our property taxes or lower our property taxes, and still have things like sewer and schools and police and fire, uh, fire departments, not fires, um, you, you have to stop building more and more out. Because the other thing that comes from that is the death of the, of the core. As families and things move away, the core becomes impossible to sustain. And we see that with school closures. We see that with, uh, the, there's no police station in all of downtown uh, Calgary because they can't afford to have a police station in downtown Calgary. I see I'm, I'm missing some, uh, make it rain. It's fucking pouring down here in the trickle though. What's the uh, return on investment for a fire extinguisher? The fire department, it's risk management, who benefits? Efficiency for whom? Calgary Spall wasn't driven by demand, it was driven by the need for cheap land for developers to build out boomtown housing and increase our base costs as a city to subsidize them. 100%, the, the developers are the problem. They are the reason property taxes are skyrocketing because developers don't want to take a, you know, a, a city block and turn it into a giant building that everyone will complain about because, oh, it's blocking my sunshine. Oh, it's, you know, it's ugly. Fine, I get that. No one likes up. We all like out. Out is bad. We can't all have fucking bungalows. We can't all have 1.3 acres of beautiful lawn. Sorry. People, people forgot King Ralph was mayor for many years, right? I actually just uploaded, I was talking about King Ralph on my stream yesterday. Uh, meanwhile, service has only marginally improved in some areas. Whole are, I'm assuming that's supposed to be while others have been significantly reduced. Um, yeah. It's only marginally improved because we keep, again, spending money to, to keep up with the growth of the city and we can't improve the services in the areas that need it. And those areas have seen significant reductions because there isn't budget for this perpetual infinite growth. City Hall must focus on core services such as an affordable citywide transit system, which ironically enough, we want the green line, but I'm fairly certain Farkas is opposed to the green line, uh, which would be an example of an affordable citywide transit system. Well-maintained infrastructure, efficient snow clearing. Um, we have efficient snow clearing if you, you know, live on a major thoroughfare, which most people don't. Um, it is also, how is it practical to assume that we're going to have snow plows on every single street? It's not. It would be a total waste of money. The efficient snow clearing, we focus on major thoroughfares for a reason. But this is one of those, because it's Calgary and because snow is a part of our lives, efficient snow clearing is one of those things that rich people bitch about all the time because up in the middle of fuck off nowhere where they live, they go, that's so hard for me. Every morning I have to go to work and it's all slippery and the roads, no one's plowing the back roads to my home. So, buy a fucking plow, rich ass. Uh, people forgot Mr. No was on council with him for many years. Mr. No, I don't remember. What service is he referring to? How is he measuring it? Yeah, that, that's, he's not specifying, right? 
it's the vague like, oh, our services are going going less and less and less. And no one's thinking about actual services. They're just like, yeah, I know that the world is harder than it was. Mm. Um, our actual services that have been reducing are things like um, social services, um, the, the impossibility of man managing snow on every single per person's street, um, you know, and on and on and on and on. Uh, when I last I checked, our garbage pickup and recycling and green bin program has improved a lot, but that's a Nenshi thing, so bad. Yeah, our, we actually have a really good garbage pickup service. Invest in mass transit instead of snow clearing every cul-de-sac and uh, side road. Totally. Leave your car at home and take transit. For me, I live close enough to the downtown core that I walk to work. Um, it's partly an economic decision because it's free for me to walk and it costs money if I'm going to take the train. But it's also a health reason. It's also a, a mind frame thing. So, you know, when, when I'm walking home from work, I, I can put all of work behind me. And by the time I get home, I feel good, even if work was a bad day. Uh, Rick McIver equals Mr. No or Dr. No. Oh, McIver, yes. Uh, that man is a soulless conservative monster. Uh, never met a tax or spend thing he couldn't uh, stifle. Uh, treating a, dr a drug addiction like a health issue and having our police service go after organized crime instead. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we make steps forward. Like the, the Sheldon Shamir had a clinic for offering um, people to, you know, have a, a, a clean needle use and exchange site. And uh, how'd that go again? Oh, right. We closed it because people in the area really didn't like having people who did heroin around. Except for the Hyperloop, I see how much in the pockets of private UCP backers, I wonder. Oh, I guarantee you, the Hyperloop, I'm, I'm not opposed to the Hyperloop. This is the idea of having a high-speed transit that will connect uh, Calgary and Edmonton and probably some of the other cities in Alberta uh, and do so quickly and efficiently. I think that's a, a good idea, but I also think that the wrong pockets are going to get lined with that one. Um... Maintain infrastructure, efficient snow clearing, and emergency services such as police and fire. So we have fire departments. We got a bunch of police. But, you know, if we want to have safer communities, we have to have a lot more police. That's the only way to have safety, right? I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, building Canada for the 21st, or Calgary for the 21st century. Calgary must be bold, welcome new ideas, and build for the future. I agree. I'm not seeing any new ideas here. We must embrace new technology in delivering services, building quality infrastructure, and creating a vibrant down core, town core that will usher in a new era of opportunity. We need to update existing infrastructure that is in disrepair and has been overlooked for too, far too long. We must focus on projects that will enhance our city's safety and competitiveness, such as reopening a downtown police station and building an LRT extension to, uh, to the airport. We can improve accountability at City Hall by genuinely listening to Calgarians and allowing them to have meaningful input in major decisions that impact them, such as neighborhood development. So that last statement is all very true-ish, right? Embracing new technology and delivering services, sure. I'll give you a, you know, just off the top of my head example. What if we had a process where we would, uh, I don't know, have, um, you know, garbage pickup so that if I'm, if I don't have garbage, I can go and say, don't bother with my house today. Now, that's a, probably a stupid example because like an entire community isn't going to be like, don't bother with my garbage. But those kinds of direct co uh, communications via applications on our smartphones, can be used to do things, um, to gather input from voters, to you know, any number of things. Um, quality infrastructure, absolutely. We, we definitely need to put some money into existing, and we always need to put money into existing infrastructure to make sure that it's being maintained properly. I'm looking at you, US of America. Um, we must focus on projects that will enhance our city's safety and competitiveness such as reopening a downtown police station and building an LRT extension to the airport. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide a contrast. Um, yeah, sure, 
having a police station downtown could make downtown safer. Although I remember when there was a police station downtown. I remember when there was a police station in the, the public library building that is no longer the main downtown public library, but the one that's like right by Center Street. Um, they used to have a cop shop in the bottom there. And right across the street was the sketchiest part of 7th, uh, 7th Ave where there was an arcade that, that is now like a, a head shop kind of thing or something. But uh, the arcade that was there was like the place to go to buy drugs downtown. And kids would like literally sit on the C train, like just sort of hang out on the on the uh, platform and be like, hash, crack, weed. And just, you know, it was that easy. And this was across the street from the cops. And the argument is the cops were like, oh, you know, but we know where it is. We can keep an eye on it. We can monitor it. It's, it's better and safer. Fine. Having a police station downtown doesn't solve problems. Cops don't prevent crimes. Cops investigate crimes, period. The only crimes they prevent are crimes of driving too quickly and the prevention is taking our money. Walk the beat, not an office. This is, but this is the thing is where we deploy our police, we, we're, we're currently doing it with this ass backwards methodology of having, uh, looking at data and going, ooh, a community like Dover, where Mr. Farkas was from, has a high crime rate, a lot of nuisance crime and a lot of poverty related crime, break and enter, uh, assault, mugging, all of those kinds of things, and nuisance crime with prostitution, ho uh, homelessness, that sort of thing. So you look at the crime statistics and you go, wow, Dover is a shithole hell on earth. We need more cops in Dover. So you put more cops in Dover. And what happens? Cops find more crimes because there's more cops walking around seeing things like nuisance crimes that are happening and go, oh, we're stopping all the crimes, which they're not stopping because those crimes already took place. And then they go, see, look at our data. We need more cops in Dover. And it's a loop. It's an endless fucking loop. Um, not, the, not the least of which I want to point out that uh, when it comes to things like everyone talks about, about theft. Uh, theft is a problem. Uh, wage theft is a way bigger problem. And no one goes after wage theft because that would be just silly talk. Um, that go means going against uh, the, the Bezoses of the world. And they're our friends. They give us money. We want to trickle down from them, so we better not fuck with them. You want to make the city safer? You want to spend city money to improve the safety of our community? Spend it on social services. Spend it on mental health. Spend it on organizations that can make an impact before the police would need to be involved. There's a, a joke, and I've referenced this before. There's a joke that's, you know, dude calls the police and goes, hey, someone's breaking into my garage. And they're like, well, you know, we're a little busy right now. We're going to send out a car in a couple of hours and, uh, you know, we'll take your statement. And then he calls them and he goes, yeah, I just shot that guy. And they're like, oh, my God. And like 10 seconds later, a cop car shows up and he's like, yeah, huck, yuck, yuck. I knew I'd get you out here. Um, that's a reality. Cops don't stop crimes from happening. They come after the fact and they prioritize crimes as I think they should, but they do it wrong. They prioritize crimes, so the guy breaking into your garage, probably not a big deal. The guy getting murdered, probably a big deal. Fine. This is the world that we leave it, live in. But police don't solve problems. When we send police in to domestic disputes, when we send police to uh, try and encourage kids not to do drugs, <laughs> that's some funny shit. Uh, perhaps community services would walk uh, the beat. Someone with I don't know, say information and access cards or access to uh, access cards to health and food and placement services. Someone who gives a shit. People are free to work anywhere they like. They don't have to work at Amazon. Free enterprise works for labor too, unless they organize and stand up for their rights and flex some labor power. That then it's just socialism, and we know that doesn't work. Yeah, damn socialists. Um, when it comes to you know, and, and I've talked about this also before. You want to revitalize downtown? 
we have a giant amount of empty space in buildings in downtown that is just not being used. And we have a giant amount of people who don't have a place to live. Wait a tick. What if we combined those two things? And I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh my God, Jim, then all of the crazy, insane, homeless people would live in buildings and would like turn them into nasty horrifying environments where like you can't walk into that building because people would be murdered all day and all night because they're deranged I tell you what if what if having a home and that stability allowed for them to do better to have better access to mental health care what if having that home type of environment gave them some structure that allowed them to do things like regularly be medicated? What if we paid for all of that and allowed people who were living on the streets to live with some dignity and not have the fear of where am I going to, how am I going to survive this week? What if we had a universal basic income that made it so that people weren't in perpetual terror when they were at the bottom rungs of society? That would make our community safer, much more safe than opening up another cop shop. So I, I have challenges with what Farkas is saying. Do we want to watch one of his videos? I feel like, I feel like we should, just to get a, a, a taste for who he is and what he's saying. So we'll watch this one. Calgary, it's time for change. Oh, I can't. We need to focus headphones. on rebuilding our economy headphones. to create jobs, good paying jobs, jobs for today and jobs for tomorrow. Over 200,000 jobs were lost in this country in April alone. The worst of that has been felt in April alone. What what was it that happened in April again? I forget. Probably nothing. Probably just me being out here in the Calgary region with unemployment as high as 13.1%. Calgarians need jobs. That's why, now more than ever, we need to start doing things differently at City Hall. We need fresh, bold new leadership to help our small businesses thrive and get Calgarians back to work. Creating yet another slush fund for the well-connected, it just isn't going to get it done. We need a city council that will give tax relief rather than tax hikes. We need to roll out the red carpet rather than the red tape. We need to like we did with Amazon, where we offered them gigantic tax breaks in order to set up shop because of, you know, the theoretical idea that it would be better for us financially to have all those jobs. I don't disagree, but... Eh. To rebuild a fair business climate with low taxes and quick approvals, to encourage entrepreneurs to stay here, to help existing businesses grow, and to be ready for tomorrow's industries. Calgary was once the destination of choice for Canada's entrepreneurs, and we can't... I don't think it was. I think Calgary was the destination of choice for people who worked in the oil and gas sector and entrepreneurs around that sector. ...once more, because this city was built by the most innovative and hardest working people in this entire country. I love Calgary, and like so many of you, my family came here for opportunity. Today, many Calgarians, especially our youth, are wondering if they have a future here. The answer must be yes. That's why You know why the youth are worried about their future in Calgary? I don't know, maybe it's something to do with ridiculous cost of living, uh, job salaries that are not keeping par with the cost of living, an almost unattainable uh, post-secondary education environment, and a need for post-secondary education to get a job that pays more than the lowest amount legally possible. So nothing that you've described solves any of these problems. That's why I need your support to help bring Calgary back on top where we belong. Now is the time for change. And most importantly, now is the time for you to get involved. Please visit www.jeremy.ca to find out how. My name is Jeremy Farkas, and I'm asking to be your next mayor. So, again, I saw this this ad the other day, or this, this poster up, that was Farkas's poster, and it was right next to a Protect Our Water. Jeremy Farkas wants to get rid of approvals. 
wants to get rid of, delays from red tape, things like, I don't know, how you deal with waste as a business. You can't protect your water and have super conservatives in power. Conservatives will always make the decision of cheap over correct. That's, that's capitalism. You cut costs no matter what. I am, I am not okay with Jeremy Farkas. I have skipped some, some things here. I am not high enough for this. I'm sorry, kitty kitty jerk face. Because jobs in City Hall are the same thing. Oh yeah, cut taxes equals jobs. Do people really eat this horse shit? You can't cut, uh, cut tax your way to creating jobs. It never worked, ever. I'm reminded of former head of uh, Petro Canada, uh, and I don't remember the, the name of the person, but he, he was quoted as saying, um, you can't shrink to greatness. In the case of a city, you can't encourage people to come to a city if it's unsafe. You can't encourage people to come to a city if there's no jobs. I totally agree with that. We need to readdress how we, how we plan and develop our city and where we allocate those funds in order to actually have a safer, more sustainable city. We talk about how Canadian, or Calgarians are the most entrepreneurial people on earth and this city was built on entrepreneurialism. And that's sort of true. Um, but that is also entrepreneurialism that was almost exclusively tied to oil and gas. And oil and gas ain't going to be there for us. You want to encourage entrepreneurial growth, focus on alternative energy. Focus on organizations that retrain existing energy workers to work in other uh, environments, such as alternative energy. Leveraging existing knowledge and existing skills to, to do that kind of work. You got a gym. Calgary was where the oil and gas money and jobs were when times were uh, good to go. Uh, uh, ugh, when times got uh, when times good, go to Calgary and make money. One bust, get out of town as fast as you can. Totally. Um, you know, it's it's a regular joke that you know, Calgary uh, has all the the newfies. All of Newfoundland basically comes to Calgary every time the oil price is good to work. Uh, newfies are hard workers, and Newfoundland has a really struggling economy. Um, so that's, that's a real thing. And then when the world gets shitty here, everybody's like, well, I guess I'll just go back home because it's shitty there, but at least I've got lobsters. Not to mention eight months of winter and four months of bad snowmobiling while eating right-wing rhetoric from an uncaring, oppressive fascist regime. Yes, that actually is, uh, the, the UCP's next slogan, Jason Kenney, because what Alberta needs is an uncaring, oppressive fascist regime. A kid, of course, Jason Kenney's not a fascist. Um, he's, he's like, he's like a, an authoritarian who wishes, he's like that O'Toole guy. I mentioned this yesterday. Um, Aaron O'Toole, who's the head of the, the federal uh, conservative party. They're the guys that like look at Trump and go, oh, one day, baby, one day I'll be that, that strong and that powerful. But they're not there yet. Uh, Jason Kenney was one of the, the Ralph Klein prodigies, um, and and it's clear in how he runs the the country. Um, Jason Kenney was terrible, uh, or sorry, Jason Jason Kenney is terrible. Ralph Klein was terrible, uh, but I think I may be wrong. Best summer ever. What am I clicking on here? I'll, uh, I'll swap over. It doesn't look like a, a horrible thing here. So it's a hat. Best summer ever, Alberta 2021. Right next to a glass of scotch or bourbon or whatever. Ben Harper says, starting to feel like the best summer ever out in Stony Plain. Um, <laughs> the notorious PFG because you're worth it. Ben, can I have some money? Boy, we're getting our money's worth out of you, aren't we? Son, you're not even at, uh, trying to hide the scotch and cigar salary at this point. And, and, I admire, ah, and I admire that gumption. 
I just know Daddy's so proud. This province has a long and storied history of richly rewarding those least deserving. Step right up. The trough's ready and waiting. Fuck yeah. That's awesome. I really enjoyed that. Uh, you might want to hit that length. Uh, this little fuck is making over 100 grand a year working part-time for the Alberta government while doing his master's in New York City. No nepotism here. Yeah. Yeah. Harper. Hmm. Is that is Ben Harper related to Stephen Harper? Let's find out. Let's let's Google the, the piss out of this. Uh, Swapsy backsies and let's 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 Ben Harper. Uh, I don't think no. That's that's a different Ben Harper. Uh, let's go Ben Harper El, uh, Alberta. Yes, Ben Harper, son, uh, uh, Stephen Harper's son, Ben, hired by Premier Jason Kenney's office. So, yes, Stephen Harper, who I lovingly refer to as the Harper bot. And that's our Benjamin right there, that, that warrior for freedom. Look at him. You can just feel the, the privilege, just feel it dripping off of him. So, I foamed a little bit of the mouth about conservatives, probably more than I wanted to. I really wanted to just talk about Farkas in specific and, and give my, my two cents when it comes to what he's claiming is the direction Alberta and Calgary should be going in. I find these things concerning because, again, there's no, there's no concept of why are, are these things the case. Property taxes are high because Silly Hall is after your money. Is it? Or is property tax high because we have an unsustainable development model being led by by developers and not by proper civic interest that puts a massive financial strain outwards with no real ability to re uh, to uh, regain that that income expenditure meanwhile resulting in diminishing services to the inner city i mean that might be a thing is our community made safer by more police or is it made safer by people who are actively engaged in doing the things that prevent the escalation of problems into crimes? He was hired as a fucking policy advisor, 24 year old policy advisor. Um, yeah, I, I, I look, there are legitimately good 24 year old policy advisors. Uh, I don't even think, um, like like Dylan Burns is a policy advisor, and I think he's under twenty four. Um, fairly certain, but but an exceptional mind. I wouldn't call Ben Harper an exceptional mind. I would say that is one of those jobs that you get because Daddy knows a guy. I feel a good rant stream coming from me soon. A federal liberal, liberal candidate just called me yesterday, and I ranted hard about conservative BS. And that's you know that's the problem is the federal liberals aren't all that far removed from the federal conservatives if if like i'm here in the political spectrum this is libertarian socialist right here and then we have this gap and then we have the ndp and then we have the liberals and then we have the conservatives and then we have the fascist actually the conservatives and the fascists so i feel so out of touch in canada because I value progress. I value liberty. I value the opportunities to do things. And at the same time, I value personal responsibility, which we aren't doing. And as a result of our not doing, we need to have some kind of authoritarian oversight. It's a catch-22. Um, and I hate it. But right now, people are, are there's a lot of information being shared about uh, the residential school system and indigenous things. Uh, related to the, the pain of indigenous people and the way that um, our government has let them down. That's all well and good. And I'm not going to talk about that. I have talked about that a lot lately. I'm not going to talk about that. What I am going to talk about is um, the conservative perspective on that is suck it up. Um, and if you protest anything, we're probably just going to drive our big ass truck through you. And uh, you don't have a right to be upset about these things because we conquered you. We never conquered them. We didn't conquer them. At least, we, you know, we conquered them on paper. Um, when, we, when we did the whole Treaty 7 thing, as an example, 
Um, they didn't know they were ceding their territory to us. They signed away their rights accidentally, essentially. And so that's not something we should be all like, check it out, we won a war. We didn't win a war. We conned people. And now we expect them to be like, I guess we got conned. <laughs> we'll live over here in this reservation and you can kill our children. I hate it too. We're having to choose between right and right. But I'm going to go with the party that doesn't fit, uh, fight against queer people. I mean, O'Toole is one piece of shit. And I will vote liberal as long as that bigot doesn't get in. I don't have a political home in Canada, that's for sure. I, my, my closest answer to that is I'm going to vote, probably, unless things dramatically change, I'm going to vote NDP. Um, because it's farther left and closer to progress. Um, I, I don't think the federal liberals are capable of progress without the NDP nipping at their heels. And uh, much of the things that have actually happened to make things improve in this country have been the liberals putting through legislation that the NDP uh, were, were behind. In terms of, of the, the legislation that the liberals have put forward, well, we will have clean drinking water at every single uh, reservation by 2021. Um, we're going to completely heal with the uh, missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, girls and two-spirit um, council or whatever it is. We're going to completely heal that rift. We're also gonna, going to uh, have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which will totally solve all of those problems. And, and that's why indigenous people are super happy and all going out to celebrate Canada today because they really feel engaged and involved. Uh, what else did they promise? Uh, oh, yes, yes. I'm so glad that we, we don't have uh, the old pa uh, first past the post voting system anymore. That was one of the first things. Well, that was one of the reasons I voted for Trudeau. And he made that dream come true. We now have representative uh, representation by the popular vote. Jim is my spirit animal lurking while at work. Hey, Nate, how you doing, buddy? I thoroughly, again, everyone follow Nate. Nate is awesome. And follow Kitty Kitty Jerkface. If, if I, I didn't know that you were uh, getting into streaming, I think we've talked about it, but I didn't know where, where you were at, Kitty. Um, so if you're on the Twitch, which I can see by icons that you are, I will come along and, and follow you and... Uh, um, support and share and love and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, no hope for the Nate. Follow him. He's awesome. Um, that's my buddy Nate. He runs... Begins Octave Studio. Octave Studio and Medicine Hat. Um, he, his stream is a combination of video game playing, but also some really... Especially on Fridays, he, he does vocal covers of uh, metal bands and stuff, and they're awesome. Um... And he's got, like, just a hell of a voice. Like, if you've ever seen the, the weekly humiliations that I do to myself, um, I sound like the poop. Nate is good. And Kitty Kitty Jerkface is an old friend of mine uh, and, and a, a charming little soul. Um, they, I don't know how often they put out content or what content they put out, but I'm going to find out because uh, rad human being. All right. Did I say everything I need to say? Does anyone have anything that they want to bring up about uh, whether it's Farkas or conservatism or the NDP or... Oh, shucks. Thanks, man. Oh, you're welcome, Nate. Um, or just, you know, Jagmeet Singh, um, since we're, we're talking politics. Again, I don't feel like Jagmeet Singh goes far enough. Um, you know, he played... Uh, what is that that game where you, you find out who the killer is, The like, above... I don't know. I don't fucking play video games. Um, but he played that with uh, AOC, which was pretty awesome. Among Us, that's the one, yes. Thank you. Thank you, kitty kitty jerk face. Um, he played Among Us with AOC. That's And uh, Hassan and Vosh, I believe. But, you know, that doesn't make you a progressive. It makes you the most progressive voice in Canada, which is kind of like, never surrender. Always stay hopeful, radiate positivity and kindness, and vote while eliminating the assholes. Totally. I, I firmly believe that we need to have these conversations. We need to talk about the, like, the purpose of my doing this video today was about I see what these, these 
coded references that conservatives are doing, I see what they mean because they're they're not they're not providing new hope and new leadership and new direction. They're doing the same thing they've always done, thus conservative. But people keep buying it. People are putting signs up about protecting their water next to a sign for a guy who's like, I don't think you should have to get an approval before dumping shit in the Bow River. I hope he encourages the youngs to vote. I think getting the youngs to vote will help the lefty representation. I agree. Um, I'm, I'm always like disheartened by the number of the youngs that are like groipers and, and really fashy adjacent or fascist. But the, the, the massive dearth of people who are young are either, you know, center left or farther and farther left. And that, that is really important. The young absolutely have to vote. And my hope is, you know, as a curmudgeonly old man, that I can, I can maybe, maybe some uh, one of the youngs sees this video and goes, oh shit, I didn't realize that, you know, Farkas was a conservative because I read it and it sounds like he's talking about like, you know, providing good services and making sure the, the, the city's safe. And th those are things that resonate with me. They resonate with everyone. The problem is that the approach that he's suggesting won't fix those problems and isn't intended to fix those problems. Again, you want to fix the problems, stop developers from going out, make them go up invest in social services, mental health, and those services as a 911 type response environment, as well as just general access to those things, and implement a universal basic income, which the liberals are, are on board for, the NDP are on board for. Okay, Big Ugly Gem has successfully increased the heart rate and high level of agitation of the neurons. Well done, Jim. I'm going for a long, slow walk with a giant bottle of water. Cheers. Might want to make that some, some vodka. It'll help. Anyways, young people vote. I had this, I had this like little tiny, I went outside for a smoke and I had like this little tiny spider on my head and I went like that and killed it. And now every time uh, my skin feels a thing, I'm like, oh, it bugs. Oh, oh, oh. I swear it's not cocaine. I don't do cocaine. But it, you know, ew. I used to work in, um, you know, bars where they would have the, what we call the wub wub shows because wub 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 and everyone's doing snot drugs and uh, you know, at the end of the night some girl would walk up and be like, oh my god, you're beautiful, we should go home together and just like glistening with cocaine and snot and I'm like, no, we're good, we're good, don't need that. All right, well I think I'm probably done foaming at the mouth, but... I do think there's a necessity to, to looking at these, uh, yeah, hot, right? To looking at these issues and saying, uh, or looking at these messages the, uh, and saying, like, that that's what you're talking about doesn't solve the problem. What you're talking about isn't innovative new forms of leadership. Oh, you want to cut taxes and encourage business to, to come to Alberta again. Where did I hear that before, Ralph Klein, Jason Kenney? every conservative who's ever lived except possibly for Peter Lougheed. Mm -hmm. So I'm tired. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of listening to the same old crap, getting fed the same old crap, and people voting the same way they always have and wondering why nothing ever changes. Nothing changes because we're not progressing. We're conserving. Just saying. 